Hello, hello. This might be the most interesting audience I've ever had. I'm going to tell you guys a couple of stories. And part of it is how I got into tech and what I love about it and what I don't like about it sometimes, but what makes it challenging and interesting. So first off, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. When I was a kid, that looks like me, that actually wasn't me, but it's a good picture. <laughs> I had, uh, do you guys ever get money for your birthday or save up money to buy something that you'd like? I had to make a decision. I had saved up about $25. This was a long time ago, so $25 was a lot of money. Can I have that later? <laughs> so I didn't have enough money to buy two toys that I wanted. Um, I wanted to be a farmer when I was a little kid. I had an uncle in Ireland that had this great farm I'd go to visit, and I said, I want to be a farmer someday. But the only problem is I didn't have a farm. But I wanted to buy this cool little tractor toy, which looked just like that. But I also saw this watch, and it had a game on it, and it was for Pac-Man. Folks have heard of Pac-Man? I think Pac-Man's back now, and Pixels and all these things, and he doesn't go away. So I was really torn. I wasn't sure what to pick. And for some reason, I picked the watch. And it was interesting because all of a sudden when I had this watch, I had all kinds of friends. I'd go to school and they'd say, oh, let me play your watch. And so I'd be standing around all day and they'd be <laughs> pushing the buttons. And it was fun and interesting. And for some reason, I figured out that technology was interesting to me. The other thing that was sort of very clever when I was little, and I don't know how I figured this out, but I figured out the job I would have didn't exist yet. I wanted to do something that hadn't been invented yet. And so that started me on a journey that was different than other people's journeys. I didn't know I could go to law school and be a judge or be a doctor. Um, technology keeps changing. So here's my journey. My family came and settled in New York, and I grew up in New York City in a place called Staten Island. Anyone heard of Staten Island? So there's five boroughs in New York City. This is the least well-known. But it's a neat place. And so I went to school. I went to middle school. Is everyone in middle school now? And then I had to pick which high school I wanted to go to. And, and New York is a little bit different, that you, uh, you can go to a regular local school, or you can go to a specialized high school. You have to take some exams and get in, but I'm sure all of you guys would be able to pass those tests. So I went to Staten Island Technical High School, and it turned out that was a really good school. And it was for folks who wanted to understand engineering and technology and study the future. But I finished three years there, and then some unthink, unplanned things happened in life, and I didn't get to finish my high school there. I ended up moving to Ohio, and all my hopes and dreams were dashed. I thought I'd get into the best college, and I thought I'd be this brilliant inventor. And I said, okay, my whole future is ruined. What am I gonna do now? Um, but you know what? I finished high school there, and I did pretty well, and all the stuff I had learned in Staten Island Technical High School still was very helpful to me. So then I said, okay, I'm gonna start at a college. And so I went to Wright State University. Does anyone know what the plane is? The symbol for the plane? Does that look familiar? Yep. The Wright, the Wright brothers who invented flight. Well, they didn't really invent flight, but they invented uh, a, a plane that could be propelled. And that was a big innovation. So I went to the school that honors the Wright brothers. And then I started working, and I lived there, and then got different jobs in industry. And then I picked security as a specialty, or I should say it picked me. It picked me because it was one of the biggest, most important problems we could solve. And this was around 1996, which to you probably seems like a long time ago. To me, it doesn't seem like that long ago. The funny thing is when you talk to people who are older than you, they forget that they're older. I still think I'm a kid, and I look in the mirror like, holy cow, like, I have gray hair now or something. But I, uh, I started working there, and I learned a lot, and I got a lot of good experience. And I started working in security, which had a lot of really interesting problems to work on. And all of a sudden, I became a rock star. I knew how to solve problems or had skills that were special and unique. And it wasn't because of one thing, it was because I could do different things. 
And that's probably one thing I want to make sure you guys learn today is if you have skills in different areas and you combine them, that can be, make you a rock star also. So I got to work for one of the biggest, best consulting firms in the whole country, and that was Accenture. And so I had to move from Ohio to Chicago. And does anyone know the name of the airport in Chicago? Yep. O'Hare Airport. So O'Hare Airport became my office. I would fly in and out all over the country working with all different companies, helping them to solve some of their security problems. And that was great experience. And then they started, uh, my company started investing and they wanted to build new companies. And so that's when I came to Palo Alto, California. And that took me all the way across the country. And I wanted to work with the most leading technology. And so I did some startups here. Everyone knows what startups are? When you have a, one idea, you want to build one thing and you can build a whole company around it. And then I started for working for big technology companies and biotechnology companies and just kept learning and learning. When I, got, when I was there somewhere for a while, I felt like I wasn't learning anymore. I said, mm, maybe I should do something new. And so I worked through a bunch of different companies and I ended up at a really interesting company, the company I work at now. And I'll describe that to you a little bit. It's called SRI International. And there's a lot of history in the Computer History Museum that you can learn about there. I also got a second job, which is sort of a hobby, and I teach classes at Santa Clara University. I'm going to actually show you some of the content I teach the graduate engineering students at Santa Clara. So you can say you had graduate engineering training today also. So these are some of the cool pictures I'm proud of. So while I was working, I also helped to volunteer. And volunteering and helping to build your community uh, really brings back a lot of rewards. So I work with the FBI in a partnership program and help them understand technology and help them to find experts that can help them solve cases. And that's called InfraGuard. And I did a presentation like this for InfraGuard. And somebody was in the audience and said, wow, that's really good. Can you write a book about that? So a friend and I partnered up and we wrote a book. And it was that easy. It took a while. But uh, having a great idea that nobody's talked about before creates lots of opportunities. And then the head of the FBI, Bob Mueller, was very happy. And it's good because they're getting volunteer help. So he came out and visited us and said, thank you for all the help. And that was a real highlight in my career. And I also put a picture in of me doing a triathlon a few years ago because I just thought that was the best rock star picture I had. So a little bit about SRI. Folks have used computer mice? Yeah. Click, click. Television? High def? You probably, bank checks are kind of obsolete now, I guess. But you've seen checks and go to the bank and cash them? iPhone, Siri, that's all stuff that SRI helped to invent and create. And so I get to work with the people who create the coolest stuff. So invented different types of cures for diseases, uh, invented robotics, robotic surgery, satellites, all kinds of things. These are things that have changed the world. These are things that I'm counting on you to do in the future. So SRI is a nonprofit. That means we're a business like another company, but we focus not just on making money, but on having a big impact on the world to make people safer, healthier, and more productive. And so this is a sample. This is, if you want to think about your future and what you want to focus on, if you want to go into a STEM area, these are the big buckets you can work in. Advanced technologies and systems, biosciences and biotechnology, education. SRI helps to design and create the tests that will affect which college you might get into. And they help to work with schools to design more effective ways to teach math and algebra and all kinds of things. Information and computing science. And this is where I do a little bit more hands-on work to invent things that can make working with computers a little easier and, and uh, easy, you know, quicker to understand. We work with the military and with all different types of mechanical devices and help them work better and help to train folks to use these technologies more effectively. 
and we partner with folks. And this is a whole career in itself, being the bridge from the inventor and the technology to business and legal areas. And so when you combine these things, it creates all types of opportunities for you. And we build really neat products like high definition television technology and cameras and night vision and all that kind of stuff. That's what SRI does. I'm kind of interested in what you would like to see become the future. Any thoughts on a really cool invention that you'd like SRI to create? Or that you'd like to create? One more time? A new video game console. A new video game console. Perfect. Yep. Um, like a bubble almost. Like something you could, like a levitating thing. A levitating bubble yeah, that like someone can go inside of? Yeah. And fly around? Yeah. Pretty I much. like this. Maybe just one more. I was gonna, I was gonna say a flying car, but. What a flying car. Actually, I think flying cars exist. Or, or it could turn into a submersible or a submarine if you want it to. Or it turns into a. A, 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 submer a, a submersible. submersible or a submarine. Or like a. Oh, that's a good idea. Kind of. These are good. So let me now that I have some inventions. Okay, one more. Um, oh, well, like a new GUI for the uh, like computers for a new graphical user interface makes it easier to use and stuff. <laughs> this is good. I like this. Making technology easier for people, that's what I'm all about. Making technology safer for people, making it solve bigger problems. So we'll, we'll, let's chat more about this at the end. I just wanted to pick a couple of examples to explain how I interact with technology. So you guys have the best ideas in the world. And the bubble might have to have some safety precautions built into it, right? You might want to have seat belts so you don't go tumbling all around the bubble, floating all over the place. The video game console, you want to make sure that no hackers can break in and steal all your points for your top scoring game. The submersible car, you want to make sure that you've got some types of systems to navigate that are able to get the maps that you need. And so my job isn't just to invent these things, it's to help the inventors. So can you see the bottom left corner of the picture? What do you see down there? It might, it might be hard to see. Who's this guy? What's his job? She's the gymnast. Uh, he could be a judge, but his job is actually, any guesses? Yep. A spotter. a spotter, you got it. Good job. A spotter. I'm the technology spotter. I want you guys to be the, the rock stars and flip and do some amazing things, but I don't want that technology to cause unintended consequences, to hurt people, to make people sad or scared or confused. So I work with these folks by applying security and good design and good engineering to make sure that the bubble turns out the way you imagined and doesn't end up being the flying bubble that goes off in, into the ocean. You guys are working on avatars. I thought of my avatar. I was stealing ideas this morning from you. Do you know what that animal is? Yep. A badger. What kind of badger? Yes? Honey badger. Honey badger don't care. You guys have heard of that? Um, the honey badger is not the biggest, toughest animal. But for its size, it's pretty strong. It can defend itself quite well, right? A honey badger can fight off a lion sometimes. Have you guys seen these videos? And then there's the cartoons of honey badger. I like what the honey badger stands for. It's tough. So my job to work in information security is to protect all these systems. And I'm up against the whole world. I'm doing defense like the honey badger. So I have to have things and tools and techniques to protect your inventions, right? So one of the techniques is how I think and how I look at problems. When you guys look at this picture, what do you see? A fish. A fish, the ocean. 
A lake? Say that one again. Coral? Perfect. Coral reefs. This is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. The way you look at this picture tells you a lot about how you think and it can tell you about how other people think. In the United States, in the western part of the world, people tend to see individual objects first and then they see the big picture, right? And then this is just generalizing, but and in the eastern world, in Japan or China or India, it's more traditional, not always, to see the big picture and then to zoom in on the pieces. So when I'm working with an engineer and I say, okay, how are we going to protect this bubble? They might want, if in America they might want to say, okay, well, let's start with the sea. And in Japan they might say, let's start with the whole bubble. So understanding how other people see the world is a very helpful way to start any engineering project. Do any of these look familiar? Energizer Bunny, there's a gecko, Coke, and who's the lady? Who, tell me, I just want to see, how many people know who Flo is? Wow. Oh, that's pretty good advertising. Advertising is a way for folks to get an idea into your head, right? These guys did a really good job with finding a little spot in your head that you weren't using and putting these ideas into it. They put these ideas in because they want you to buy their products, which is okay or not okay. But after today, after right now, I want you to put filters up. These aren't your ideas. These ideas aren't going to help change the world. They're interesting and you can listen to them, but there's bigger things you can be thinking about. And that's where I want you to save that space for something more special. So forget about this flow. I want to teach you about this flow. Have you ever been working on something where you're thinking about a problem and it's 10 o'clock and then all of a sudden you look at the camera again and it's 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock? Does that happen? And what does it feel like? Time just washes away and you're just in the zone, right? That's flow. So this is the time in your life to figure out where your flow comes from. Not this flow. So flow is when you feel like you're in the zone, when you're working on something, when you're genuinely interested in it. You might not even know why you're interested in it, but it has your attention. So this is your chance, when you're a little bit younger, to find your flow. What do you like to do and what you're interested in? And you expose yourself to playing with Raspberry Pi and to drawing an avatar and to speaking in front of an audience. Who loves to speak in front of an audience? That's better than I thought. You can learn to love this. I love to. This is fun. Everyone's looking at me. Look at my shoes. I'm, this is good. So you can find your flow. and other things you can do to look at and see the world a little bit differently. So these are from the Exploratorium and the Tech Museum, um, really cool places to visit and learn about. There's a lens, there's a mirror, there's a heat-seeking picture. I shouldn't say heat-seeking, thermal imaging picture. Heat-seeking would be kind of dangerous. There's a satellite that can see other electromagnetic, spe electromagnetic spectrums coming from outer space. These are different ways to see the world. You can learn about these technologies and see things differently and find things that other folks haven't found before. So I'm going to show you one slide that I actually use in my real college class. These are for folks get, going for a graduate um, degree, a master's degree in computer engineering, which you could end up doing hmm, 10 years from now. These are strategies. So how do I protect folks? How do I protect the systems? I have to think about, do I want to try to defend something? Is the problem so big I want to get rid of it? Uh, and you start with a big strategy. You start at the high level. So I put 
systems in place to defend things, to protect things, and sometimes when things go wrong, I have to do an investigation and figure out what went wrong to make sure that a system doesn't get hacked again, that your play console doesn't lose all of its coins again because maybe there wasn't a good firewall in front of it. And this is a picture from my office. This is the kind of work I would do on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not quite as colorful or glamorous, but I can think through a problem and say if I was in your shoes and I was uh, an engineer designing something, this is what I would want to do. If I was um, the system administrator running the system, this is what I would want to do. And you can plan things out and put yourself in other people's shoes, any color shoes, and figure out what your role is. Some other cool tools. And this is, I, I stole this from the Tech Museum. Uh, who has a new cyber, has anyone seen this exhibit? It's pretty neat. It's kind of complicated, but it's fun, right? So you go through an exercise and you learn different tools. So on the right corner up here is a representation of a network and all the systems on a network and looking at how they communicate with each other. This is the kind of stuff I do have to do at work regularly. And if one system starts doing something funny or trying to connect to another system or communicate, I need to track it down. I might need to shut it off. I might need to do a forensic examination of the system to understand how it might have got hacked into. Um, and I need to figure out all the other things that will affect. There's some other old school ways to do investigation. Do you know what this kid is standing inside of? Say again? A dumpster. He's what? He's dumpster diving. So this, people do this, um, you know, good and for bad, usually for bad. Uh, so people put confidential information in the trash and then they throw it out and other people will go through the dumpster and fish it out and they can steal your great invention. You're going to spend years working on that fantastic floating bubble and then if you put the wrong design information into the dumpster, somebody might just steal it and they'll make it before you can and take all of your hard work. So helping folks protect their great ideas is part of my job too. And in the future, we're going to have even better tools to do this. Tools that use artificial intelligence, tools like Siri that can talk to you and interact with you, tools that can visualize things, tools that can watch your eye movement as you read on a screen and figure out what you're reading to know what you're thinking about. And if you get an email and you don't read something important, it might say, uh-oh, make sure this person gets an alert. And all different types of things and technologies can help us, help me do my job better. There's two other cool uh, books or TV series that I recommend. One is really old called Connections. And the new one is called How We Got to Now. And what I like about these programs is they show systems. So I'm not sure I'm really an engineer. Sometimes I'm an engineer. I'm really a cybersecurity guy. But if I was an engineer, I'd call myself a systems engineer because I think about all different systems and how they interact with each other. And these shows are really cool because they explain how systems and technology interact with each other and how one thing combined with another thing leads to the coolest GUI on the coolest video console that you're actually playing while you're levitating. Who thought that all these things would come together? So I can dive in deep on one area. So I can talk about firewalls and I can talk about network security and hacking and all these stories in the news. But I rather focus on how we can fix some of the problems. And so thinking about people and how people interact with systems is one of the most interesting parts of my job. So what I've learned is to tell people, you know, back up your information, don't go to, you know, dangerous websites. Um, listen, eat your spinach, all these things um, aren't really fun and sometimes they're not really going to happen. Understanding how people behave and how people work with systems is very helpful. And as you design and then code and then build, if you're doing it understanding how people work with the technology, you're going to build a much better levitating bubble. So we can't sit somebody down. I'm sure your parents tell you this, right? Clean up your room. How many people clean up their room the first time your parents ask you to? Good, but honest, okay. Um, if you look at 
folks at work, I'd say, clean up your office, or clean up this system, or clean up this uh, whole data center, right? But I have to do it in a way that makes sense to them. They understand why they would want to do it. And so that negative reinforcement doesn't always lead to good outcomes. So asking people to do something they don't understand is also dangerous. So making for sure that if we're asking someone to play this video game console, we give them some type of instructions or we make it easy to use. So we try to figure out what we want people to do. This is, what I te this is the stuff I teach graduate engineering students. So you guys are going to be at that level in about 10 minutes. You figure out what behavior you want them to perform and then try to figure out why they're not doing it already. What's the obstacle? If it's so easy, well, maybe they would just do it. So this happens to be a picture from one of our, our research labs. This is a robotic suit that has all types of muscle reinforcements in it, artificial muscle, so someone could carry a very heavy uh, load on their back. So if we want someone to carry a heavy load, and we don't, well, why aren't they doing it now? Well, they don't have enough strength. So we can design a system to help them do that. And this is research from Stanford University, and they have a whole lab that studies this stuff and figures out what can we do to help people do the things that we'd like them to do. So make sure there's some motivation, there's some reason you want to clean your room. Everybody likes ice cream. And make sure that the behavior is easy to do. And make sure, and this is the critical part, this is where if you think about systems this way, you'll have a big advantage. If you want the behavior to happen, if you want to make sure that someone presses the right button on the video console to protect their, their coins or their credits or their level at the right time, how do you trigger them to do that at just the right time? And so in the design step, that's one of the things that you put yourselves in this, in the the shoes of, of the user and understand how they would interact with it. And you can design and test like that. In cybersecurity, I use this slide. It's like a magic trick and it surprises people. I ask people who are responsible for managing systems, if you could ask your, the people you work with to do three things differently, what would they be? So what are three things that you would like to see people do differently when they're um, in cyberspace to protect themselves? Any ideas? Has anyone ever heard of uh, clicking on a, a, a link in an email and getting an infection from that? You've heard of that? Or has anyone heard of phishing with a PH? That's when someone will try to get information from you that they really shouldn't be trying to get. And using good passwords. And here's another thing that most folks forget. A daisy chain is when you connect all these things together and you can pull uh, on the daisy chain and the whole thing will just unravel with one little yank. So if you take all these accounts and s uh, passwords that you use, if you use the same password on um, your school account and your face, hopefully you're not on Facebook yet, I hope, but when you are, Facebook and different sites, if you use the same password, it's a daisy chain. So that if someone can hack your passwords, they're going to have everything. So the trick is to use different passwords on different accounts, even if they're just a little bit different. Most folks have used Microsoft products, Windows, that type of thing. Some use Mac. How many people use Microsoft or PCs? And how many use Macs? And how many use both? There we go. Okay, so we covered the bases here. Um, so these are basic things. You can change your behavior right now when you go home today and work with your parents and your friends and teach them these simple steps. And this stuff is probably worth writing down. I think we will post a video so you can come back to it. But these are things that will protect you, insulate you from some risks from technology using up-to-date antivirus software, strong passwords, that means they're complicated, they have numbers and symbols and upper and lower case, that you keep your security settings correct if you're going to use a new app. Um, most folks give away their privacy so easily. Almost out of time. And running personal firewalls on their systems. And we can talk about this more afterwards if you like. I'll be around the afternoon if you want to talk more. Backing up your data onto a separate hard drive and then protecting from power surges and things like that. Perfect timing.
And there's my honey badger. You can be a honey badger too. I have some things from work that I can show real quickly. Let me, let me just give you a sense of these. Does anyone know why I would have brought a water purification straw? That's kind of a weird thing for cybersecurity, right? Any thoughts? Yep. Well, um, maybe it's for a, um, maybe it was designed by the company SRI. That's a pretty good guess. Maybe it was designed by my company. Different reason in this case. Uh, one that's pretty hard to guess. Part of my job is to help people be prepared, prepared for disasters also. So if our data center gets flooded and we have to rebuild it, those people have to come to work and they have to, during an earthquake or something, we'd like them to help us get the systems up and running again quickly, right? We'd like them to make sure that they and their families have a clean supply of water because that's something you don't want to have to worry about after a disaster. So if there's a big earthquake, you can't really expect any help for about three days. So make sure you've got a three-day supply of water. And so it's my job to make sure my, myself and my family have water so that I can go and do work stuff if I had to. Here I have a bag with all my tools to do forensic investigation and make copies in ways that I could take to court. I'll leave these out so you can take a look at them. Here's an evidence bag. If I, I don't like to do investigations. I'd rather just build a system that doesn't get hacked into to start with. But if I do, I would take the hard drive, and you see there's a number on the bag there, and this has a special seal on it. So I would collect the evidence, and I would seal it here, and that's called chain of custody. I've done an investigation, and I can prove that the evidence I collected from the beginning hasn't been tampered with. So it's kind of neat. At Santa Clara University, there's really good material on ethical decision making and how to think through problems. So I'll hand this up here. I've got a picture of what our computer network looks like. And also a picture, a book that's pretty neat about big data and all the interesting things you can use, computing science and problems that you can solve. So, okay, now I'm ready for questions. All right, great. I think we probably have a lot of questions here. So um, we'll alternate between sides of the rooms. So we can start here. Um, I have two questions. First one, what do you enjoy? First question, what do I enjoy? Yeah. And let's see, in my, whole, in my work or my whole life or everything? Everything. Everything. Sometimes I enjoy pizza a little too much, but <laughs> seriously, um, I, uh, no, I really enjoy spending time with my family. I enjoy going to work. and This is a big deal. Only so many people in the world get to actually go to work and really like what they do and feel like they're making a difference in the world, and I'm really grateful for that. I also like to do things like bike riding and playing with my kids. And my second question is, what are you good at? Second question is, what am I good at? That's a really good question. So what are my strengths? And everyone who understands what their strengths are and can build off of those strengths has a big advantage. So I'm good at imagining the future. I'm good at thinking about systems and how things connect together. I'm good at thinking about how things can go wrong and how they can break. And maybe growing up in New York, I realized that, because in New York, if you leave your bicycle out front, someone's going to steal it pretty easily. I can imagine people doing bad things. I don't like doing bad things, but I like being able to imagine that. So thinking about that and thinking about strategy, that's the fun stuff for me. Yep. Yes, sir. Who was your childhood hero? Who was my childhood hero? I think my first one, and it was actually back to the first slide, was my Uncle Willie. My Uncle Willie ran a farm in Ireland, a dairy farm, and I just thought he was the coolest guy in the world because he was able to take that land and the creatures and produce milk from that, and I thought that was kind of amazing. So um, from there, I've had lots of different mentors, people who have helped me understand problems and think, and um, professors um, and members of my family, but Uncle Willie was my first. Um, well, if you had to choose any of your inventions or ideas, what was, um, what was your favorite one? 
If I had to choose from any of my inventions or ideas, what was my favorite? Um, a lot of times I've helped other people with the inventions. Um, the one that had the biggest impact was when I worked for a software company that was working with a customer, and the customer was designing chips that were worth billions of dollars, and they didn't want to um, let those ch the chip designs out of their site because somebody could steal them. And my company needed to uh, redevelop their software to work with those more sophisticated chip designs. So my company didn't want to let their software out of its site. They didn't want to let the chip company out of its site, the, their design. And I figured out a way to build a secure environment that could bring both things together. And that led to, uh, and this was uh, chips that go into cars. So I didn't design the chips, but I helped the engineers figure out how they could work together in a trusted way. And that was cool. Oh, sorry. Over here. What do you think you'll do in the future since you said that you enjoy thinking about the future? Well, what do I think about the future? No, what do you think you'll do in the future? Well, what do I think I'll do in the future? That's kind of an exciting question because I'm not done. I'm not halfway done with my career yet. So um, I'll definitely keep coming to places like this when I'm invited and teaching and interacting with folks and keep teaching at university. Um, and at SRI, I think I might stay for a while because it's a pretty neat place. And um, we're working on some new inventions now that will help folks working in cybersecurity solve problems that they're not really solving that well now. Um, and who knows? Who knows after that? I want to make a movie someday. But I think that's a long ways off. Yep. Who would you want to um, follow you, like, in your footsteps? Who would I like to follow me in my footsteps? That's a neat question. Mm, probably two ways to answer that. One, well, I do have kids. I like to teach them what I do, and they think it's interesting. But I'd rather them see the world and find their flow. And if they can follow their footsteps of finding the way they think the world is interesting, then I'll feel like they're following my footsteps. Um, but I really hope a lot of people do the work that I'm doing now because there's a lot of difficult problems to solve and a lot of systems are getting broken into and your data is being stolen and it's really quite nasty. So the students I teach at college, I hope they follow in my footsteps and I try to help them in their career to do that. Yep. Um, so, like, for artificial intelligence, do you mean like Siri or like robots that have like a mind like humans but can do capabilities that humans cannot? So for artificial intelligence, do I mean Siri or ro robots with brains or capabilities that humans can't do? Mm, maybe more the first piece. So Siri is pretty simple. Here's another term that you'll want to remember. It's called natural language. And in computing, it's called natural language processing. So the ability to take the way people use language and interpret it for a computer to use, that's a really big deal. That's the part of artificial intelligence I think is neat. And then from there, uh, there's things like machine learning that can help people make decisions. But I think all technology comes from the human mind. So I think of it as an extension of people. I never think of robots being different or more than people, but just tools that we use. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, we've got one more on this side here. Uh, when did you find your flow? When did I find my flow? I, I'm always trying to find my flow. So I find it in little windows and pockets. Um, sometimes if I go on a bike ride and I'm just thinking about things and I forget about time, I find it. I found my flow right before this session. I had these slides put together and I said, there's maybe a better way for me to explain this or kind of move some pictures around. So for the hour or so before this presentation, I was in flow. And that hour went by in like 10 minutes. And so it's sad because it, like, it's what you love doing and then you realize it's over pretty much when you think about it. But um, I, I keep finding it all the time. That's part of, I think, the fun of life. Yep. How long have you been working for 
SRI? How long have I been working for SRI? So the simple answer is three years. Um, what's more interesting is I went there as a consultant. And I, consulting is fun because you can work for all different companies. And so actually many of the companies mentioned today, KLA 10 Core, uh, SanDisk, I've helped them with their security programs also. And so as a consultant, you can do lots of things. And then I said, I don't really want to give that up. But then I realized SRI is like the coolest place in the world. I've got to work there. So I gave up consulting after about six months and said SRI is going to be the place that I work. Right. Well, I think we probably have a lot more questions, but we're going to have some time at the end. Um, so are there any final kind of thoughts and inspiring words you want to share with this room full of students who might also follow in your footsteps? There's some really big, exciting problems to solve. I hope you find them exciting because they're also a little bit scary and someone's got to solve them. So all the technology and all the great things you can imagine, um, if you're not working in security, you're definitely going to be working with security people and finding them and finding experts to help you build systems that are worthy of the people, people's trust is really important. And we're counting on you to do that. Great, thank, thank you, you so much. And let's give a huge round of applause to our friend Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.